This video is supported by Brilliant.org. Why are we? Why is anything? Why is there something and not nothing? What is reality? Does existence exist? These are stupid questions. But they're the ones that start stabbing your brain when you start thinking really deeply about math. Yeah, math. Math is an intriguing subject because it's simultaneously the most perfect, exact, accurate measure of all things. In fact, it's the basis of all science. Nothing really exists until you can prove the math. But it's at the same time, one of the most abstract concepts in our shared human experience. Think about it. You can see a star and study its properties. You can hold a rock. You can hold a light bulb. These are things, real tangible things. But you can't hold a number. Numbers aren't things. You might have two rocks or two light bulbs, but you don't have a two. Two is just a descriptor of the quantity of the things that you have. And that's what the most fundamental math, when you get up into more advanced calculations with infinities and massive equations and stuff like that, it gets even more murky. When a mathematician comes up with a new equation, did he discover that or did he invent it? Because again, you can discover a rock. It was something that was always there and you can invent a light bulb because it was something that didn't exist before. Which one is it with math? Is math something that has always existed, an intrinsic part of the fabric of the universe? Or is it something we just made up? To say that math was never my strongest subject would be the understatement of the year. In fact, the only class I ever failed in my life was a pre-calculus class in college. Although in fairness, my professor sucked. I took it again with a different professor and actually made a B, so I'll just blame him. So I'm glad to hear that when I was in college and I was doing this, this is bullshit. I wasn't necessarily wrong. But it's not bullshit. Math is the most powerful tool in our arsenal for understanding the physical world. The mathematician Eugene Widner once famously said that math is unreasonably effective at describing the universe. It was this unreasonable effectiveness that caused some of the earliest philosophers in regards to math to consider the numbers to be real abstract objects that live and function independently from us. This was the view of the Platonists. Platonists named after the philosopher Plato. He believed that just as the proverbial rock and light bulb exist independently from us, so do numbers in an abstract realm. And since they exist independently of us, they are discovered and not created. Now, modern Platonists don't hold the exact uh, view that Plato did, that numbers exist in some, you know, number realm, a little number heaven, if you will. But they do hold that numbers and the math that arises out of them are fundamental intrinsic qualities of the universe. And any new proofs or theorems are revealed, discovered and not created. It's easy to see how they could come to this conclusion. I mean, it's not just that math does such a great job of explaining everything around us, but there were actually some theorems and mathematical proofs that were created totally in isolation, no connection to anything, that then decades, even centuries later, were found to perfectly describe some aspect of the universe. The Fibonacci sequence is a perfect example of this. Fibonacci, also known as uh, Leonardo of Pisa, created this in 1202, and it was meant to help explain the mating patterns of rabbits. And it's a pretty simple mathematical sequence where each number in the sequence is the sum of the two numbers that preceded it. So one, two, and then one and two makes three, two and three makes five, three and five makes eight, and so on and so forth. Not much more than a clever little math exercise. But when plotted out on a graph, you get this interesting spiral pattern at very specific proportions. And you see this pattern literally everywhere, like everywhere. It's so prevalent it's been called the golden ratio and has been imbued with mystical properties. And then there's theoretical mathematician G.H. Harvey, who even he thought that his work was just pure math and had no real practical application to the real world. But then later it was found that one of his theorems perfectly explained genotype frequencies and populations, which broke new ground in genetics and actually won the Nobel Prize. But there are a lot of problems with Platonism, one of which is that it's very metaphysical. To say that numbers and the math that arises out of them are an intrinsic quality of the universe, you have to explain where that intrinsic quality came from. I mean, everything else that exists, you have to explain where it came from. Did math come from the Big Bang? Is it an emergent quality that arose from the fundamental forces that were created in the Big Bang? If math is a real thing, what makes it real? It's easy to see why Platonism is popular amongst mathematicians, not just because this is what they do, so of course they want it to be real, but also because of its exactness. That's actually what draws a lot of people to math. That's what makes it very attractive. When you solve an equation, there is no room for debate. That is the answer. Boom. 
done. There's a reason why they call mathematical proofs a proof. Because it's proof. There's no room for argument. In all the other sciences, a theory can be disproven later on with new information, and theories can change, but mathematical proofs, those are forever. Math is the thing that confirms all the other sciences. It's the hat rack that all the other sciences hang their hats on. So it has to be real. Right? Not according to the fictionalists. Mathematical fictionalism is the idea that numbers just straight up do not exist in any physical form, therefore numbers are not real and math is not real. To explain their main argument, I'm just going to read directly from the Stanford University uh, Encyclopedia of Philosophy. 1. Mathematical sentences like 4 is even should be read at face value. That is, they should be read as being in the form of FA, and hence as making straightforward claims about the nature of certain objects, e.g. 4 is even, should be read as making a straightforward claim about the nature of the number 4. But, 2. If sentences like 4 is even should be read at face value, and if moreover they are true, then there must actually exist objects of the kinds that they are about. For instance, if 4 is even makes a straightforward claim about the nature of the number 4, and if this sentence is literally true, then there must actually exist such a thing as the number 4. Therefore, from 1 and 2, it follows that 3, if sentences like 4 is even are true, then there are such things as mathematical objects. But 4, if there are such things as mathematical objects, then they are abstract objects, i.e. non-spatio-temporal objects. For instance, if there is such a thing as the number 4, then it is an abstract object, not a physical or mental object. But 5, there are no such things as abstract objects. Therefore, from 4 and 5 by modest tollens, it follows that 6, there are no such things as mathematical objects. And so from 3 and 6 by modest tollens, it follows that 7, Sentences like four is even are not true. Indeed, they're not true for the reason that fictionalists give, and so it follows that fictionalism is true. <laughs> and now brain matter is oozing from my ear. It should be noted that fictionalists don't necessarily think that math has no value. They still see it as a good way to kind of measure the world around us. They just don't think that it's necessarily true. In the same way that even if you don't believe the Bible is true, you can still see that there's some value in the teachings in the Bible about how you should live your lives and whatnot, you know, uh, love thy neighbor and that kind of thing. They actually talked about that in a great video from Number File. I'll link it here. The problem with the fictionalists is how do they explain how successful math has been at explaining the world and forwarding science and technology and creating the world that we live in today? How could it do that if it's not true? And they would argue that just because something is successful doesn't make it true. Now those are the two extremes of the spectrum. In between those two you have some more nuanced theories. Nominalism tries to sort of split hairs by saying that when somebody says that 3 is a prime number, what they're really saying is that if 3 existed it would be a prime number. Yeah, basically just splitting hairs. The physicalists believe that numbers do exist, but only in relation to physical objects. So like if you have three sticks and then you get two more sticks, you now have five sticks. And this is really how we learn numbers when we were kids. So it does work on a fundamental level. But the physicalists run into trouble when you get into complex numbers and infinities and stuff like that, because you can't actually have an infinity of things. So that's where their worldview breaks down. And then there's psychologism, which actually says that numbers do exist, but only in mental states, only in our heads. But that runs into the same problem that the physicalists do, because you can't hold infinite things in your head. I mean, I'm fairly smart, but I don't think I have infinity things in my head. Then there's neo meonogianism which, on top of sounding like something from the Matrix, states that there are no such things as mathematical objects, but mathematical statements are still true. In other words, just believe it, and that will make it so. Who needs a drink? Now, I know many of you are watching this and thinking, this is bullshit. It does come off like a lot of philosophical babble, but the fact remains the single most accurate tool we have for understanding the universe, the very basis of all science, is based on a complete abstraction. And this is why when you hear people talking about SETI or extraterrestrial intelligence, they, they're looking for mathematical signals coming from deep space, or whenever they want to communicate with potential aliens, they want to use the language of math because they believe that math would be the universal language. And I'm not convinced it is. In last week's video, I asked people to ponder the situation of if we came across a super advanced alien species that had answered all the questions there are to answer and know the exact nature of reality, and they tried to explain that to us, if that would be anywhere near our current understanding of reality. By the way, the general consensus in the comments was no, we wouldn't be anywhere near it and probably wouldn't be able to comprehend it. But now I want to push that a little bit further and ask, what if math 
isn't the universal language we think it is? What if it isn't the answer we think it is? What if in order to really understand the nature of the universe, we need an entirely new tool, not numbers or words, but a new way of seeing things, or maybe even a whole sense that we don't currently have? What would that look like? Let me know what you think in the comments. And before you ask, no, I'm not high. <laughs> this is me completely sober. So as I said at the beginning of this video, I've always struggled with math all the way through school. That was a long time ago though, and uh, you know, now that I'm older, I feel like maybe I could get a little bit better handle on it, so I've been trying to bone up on my math with Brilliant.org. They walk you step by step from one concept to another so you don't wind up with brain dripping out of your ear. What makes Brilliant brilliant is they help you figure it out so that they actually, you know, kind of teach you how to learn. And even if you get something wrong, they tell you that that's okay, you know, getting stumped is part of the process. And that's such a powerful message for people who struggle with math, especially. They've got an entire section on math courses, everything from the very basic stuff, where I am, to the super advanced stuff. You've got algebra, calculus, probabilities, number theories, and quantitative finance. Sign up for free at brilliant.org slash answerswithjoe and you can get access to their daily puzzles and brain teasers to help keep you sharp. And the first 295 people to sign up for their premium subscription, which gives you access to all their courses, get 20% off your subscription for life. It's an awesome deal and an awesome way to get smarter. Brilliant.org slash answerswithjoe, links in the description. A big thanks to Brilliant for supporting this show and also a special thank you to the Answer Files on Patreon who are helping to support this channel. I do this pretty much as my day job now, so I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. There are some new people that have joined the tribe recently. I want to give them a quick shout out. We've got Alexander T. Nelson, Frank Celestino, Anton Karatnik, uh, David Cabrera, Brett Haugen, Clark, John Regal, and Nicholas Bissett. Thank you guys so much for joining. If you would like to join them, get access to secret perks that other people don't get to see, you can go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. And t-shirts, as always, available in the t-shirt store. There's another design right here and dozens more if you like them. Um, they're really cool. They support the channel, help support a designer named Michael in Prague. So you can go to uh, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts to get those. All right, like and share if you like it. And if this is your first time here, I invite you to check out some of my other videos. And if you like those, please do subscribe. I'll come back with videos just like this every Monday. All right, thanks for watching. You guys go out and have an eye-opening week, and I will see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.